I'm Greg Dalton. I'm Mariana Brocious. And this is Climate One. On the show today, we're going to focus on one state that has spent decades prioritizing climate action, my home state of California. I spent most of my life here, and I know sometimes we can sound like virtue signaling, wine drinking, tree hugging elites. That can be true. And for decades, California has been a national leader on climate protection. Yeah, aside from hogging like a third of the Colorado River. Totally true. Thank you, Arizonan. (laughs) I agree California does a lot of good things. It was the first state to regulate automobile emissions, and it started standards for energy-efficient appliances. Right, and a lot of people don't remember Governor Ronald Reagan created the California Air Resources Board in 1967. It started regulating air quality before the U.S. EPA even existed. And because California is such a huge force, it's the fifth largest economy in the world, it sets the tone for a lot of national policies too. Like the fact that it sets stricter air regulations than the Clean Air Act, and car manufacturers basically have to follow them because other states have adopted California's auto pollution standards too. There's some truth that the future happens first in California. California enacted a low carbon fuel standard 13 years ago. Then Oregon and Washington followed suit, and now seven more states have introduced legislation to enact one. The state has been bullish on renewable energy, and it's paying off. Here's California Governor Gavin Newsom speaking at a press conference last week. 40 days out of the last 48. 40 of the last 48 days. We've been running 100% clean energy on the grid. This is simply unprecedented. The fifth largest economy in the world 11 days straight, breaking all records, 100% green, wind, water, solar. I mean, it's just extraordinary, proving all of the naysayers wrong. That is a real accomplishment. So let's clarify the California grid wasn't running at 100% clean energy for the entirety of each of those 40 days, just for some portion of those days. But still, it's a big deal. We didn't think it was possible just a few years ago, and it shows what is possible. Greg, I noticed Governor Newsom was really intentional about saying California is proving all the naysayers wrong. Are there specific naysayers he's talking about? Well, there's a narrative from industry and business and conservative leaders who have doubted that California can meet such ambitious climate goals without wrecking the economy. And yet... California's economy is proving those naysayers wrong. It's high cost, and it's also robust. We keep growing while reducing emissions. Right. California hit another major milestone recently. The state now has more than 10 gigawatts of battery storage on the grid. Those batteries store renewable electricity for use when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. 10 gigawatts. That's mind-blowing. That's like 10 nuclear power plants. And built way faster than a single nuclear power plant, which typically takes decades. California went from practically no battery storage on the grid to this much in just six years. So that's really changing the old narrative that we need fossil fuels when there's no wind or sun. Last week was Earth Day, of course. And it was also San Francisco Climate Week, which brings together leaders and the general public for more than 300 different events. Greg, you were there. Yeah, it was exciting. There were events all around town. Bike rides and tours of green homes, climate karaoke. We even had a sustainable fashion show at the Commonwealth Club. I've never smelled so much pot or seen so much skin around the office. (laughs) That was the fun part. There's also a lot of serious stuff, too. People geeking out on all sorts of solutions to our climate challenge. And I led a series of live conversations exploring how California is trying to make good on its climate goals. I'm excited that we're going to share three of those conversations on the show today. Up first, your conversation with two Democratic state senators, Nancy Skinner and Scott Weiner. They chair the Housing Committee and Budget Committee, respectively, positions with huge influence over the state's climate policies. We started the conversation talking about the challenges of the state budget, which is currently facing a shortfall expected to be tens of billions of dollars. The state goes through cycles of having a lot of money and not much money. In fact, Senator Skinner remembered that just a few years ago, tax receipts were filling government coffers somewhat unexpectedly. We had this huge windfall of money. We're like, we're going to invest in more clean energy, more emissions reduction, more resiliency and adaptation for these actual impacts we're already feeling from climate change. But we're going to have to cut back on those. We're just going to have to. But here's the good news. Biden's Infrastructure and Jobs Act 
is bringing so much money into the state for things like our electrical ve electric vehicle charging, our water infrastructure, a lot of the things that we had used the budget to fund. So while it's not going to completely make up for it, fortunately, we at least have this great input of uh, federal funds. And just a shout out to Biden. You know, they call that the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Both of them were great climate acts. They were. Senator Reid, at the center of those laws is electrifying everything, stopping burning things, basically, and taking wind and sun and putting it in our homes. But there's a lot of pressure on legislators now saying, whoa, the prices to business, prices to consumers. So is that really putting the electric transition at risk? Uh, I think if we don't get a better handle on electricity, on power, um, it's going to make the transition harder. And it, and it's already doing this. It arms the climate deniers, the right wingers, with an argument that, look, you can't even, you know, you, you don't have a reliable enough grid. And President Biden, once again, delivered on this in terms of grid modernization. Uh, there's funding and those two laws uh, to do that. And we need to take advantage of it. And we need to streamline and accelerate our permit process, which we did some of last year. We have to do a lot more. It should not take years to get that permit. It needs to take a matter of months. Senator Skinner, electric rates in Northern California has increased 28 percent in, in three years, and those hikes are funding climate-related projects, some good things. It's also some bills coming due from past things that PG&E didn't do, uh, but their track record is not very good you know, on deferred maintenance, et cetera. So who should bear those costs? Because consumers are screaming, should the company, so should some of the shareholders pay some of those costs? The PUC has an incredibly hard job, so I, it, really hard job. But as consumers of electricity with those kind of rates, and we look at the type of uh, revenue above the profits that PG&E is making and what they're paying their uh, executives, it's kind of hard to accept. Like, what are we doing? Why are we paying these 17 people? Seventeen million, I think it was. Yeah. But here's some other aspects of it: the wildfire situation. We all experienced it. We in the Bay Area, we were in the nighttime in the middle of the day because of the smoke. It's so damaging to our health. And so a portion of our rates are now paying PG&E to do the type of wildfire mitigation. Well, hopefully in the next couple of years, we can reduce that. We don't have to use rates for that because again, the Biden administration bills are going to bring money for wildfire over a five-year period, very significant amount of monies for mitigation, meaning for uh, vegetation management, for all the kinds of things we're now using rates for. There's been a lot of negative coverage of electric vehicles recently. They're still meeting on the high end of, of what f uh, models suggested, but there's, the, the rate of growth is slowing. Although the Chinese drivers bought 5 million EVs last year, so EVs are definitely taking off in, in China. So how big a setback is this, you know, this sort of this, the narrative really of slowing well, growth of EVs? Yeah, I mean, there is a narrative. We are, California is doing well overall with EVs. We have much higher uptake than other parts of the country. 20 something percent of the yeah, sales. Yeah, we're, 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 we have a lot of work to do in terms of the charging infrastructure, but we're making progress there as well. Uh, and we do need to electrify the whole fleet. And until we get there, we need to make sure that all of our cars are more uh, fuel efficient. I also, I, I do just want to say, and I, I am not always popular for saying this, that an EV is still a car. And although I do want all cars to be zero emission, that is a very important goal. I also don't want us to keep our addiction to everything has to be about driving a car and everything has to be designed around the needs of cars. We, we've messed up so many cities in redesigning uh, to just favor cars. Um, EVs way more than than combustion engine cars and don't pay gas tax. So, so they, to, they damage the roads. Or, so yeah. we need to mm -hmm. move to a vehicle miles traveled fee. Mm -hmm. So you know, everyone is, is paying, but we have to uh, invest in our public transportation systems, massively invest. We have to have long-term stable funding to have more transit, not less. And I have to say on high-speed rail, and we can call it high-speed rail. I like to just call it an, a, actually having a statewide rail system in the state of California, which we don't have. And Amtrak, no offense, doesn't count because it takes twice as long to take a train from the Bay Area to LA as it does to drive. 
Um, it's absurd and embarrassing that we do not have statewide rail service in California. And we have allowed um, right-wing obstructionists to win the PR battle of high-speed rail, the train to nowhere. Well, LA and San Francisco and Fresno and San Jose are not nowhere, and we need to just get it done. We, we have to course correct on that and make that happen. Senator Skinner, a few days ago, a private company broke ground on a high-speed rail line called the Bright Line that will run from Southern California to Las Vegas. They aim to be operational in time for the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles. Uh, but our state front program is struggling and still, what, $100 billion short of what it needs to finish. Should we plow forward? We should plow forward. I've been to Japan. I've been to Spain. I just was in France in the fall looking at high-speed rail in all of those countries. It's efficient. People use it. It's much lower carbon than air it's travel. A pleasant experience. It's a, yes. <laughs> and we'll get there. Sure, we can say, I love driving my car. I always, I just want to be in my own car. I don't want to be around everybody else. But we're really dependent on it because of our land use decisions in this state over a good 50, 60 year period. And most of us live in areas where to get to work or to get to our kids to school or to do our whatever services we need, we have to drive. We have, we're far away. Our housing is not dense enough. This housing land use transportation conundrum is a huge contributor to our climate crisis, and it is very much why we're facing many of the challenges that we're facing today. Right. So, Senator Weiner, this gets to your, your housing work, to having transit-oriented development, and there are a lot of parking lots near uh, transit that have been turned into housing. You want to do more. Uh, is that happening fast enough? It is not happening quickly enough. And we've, we, you know, we've planted the seeds with a lot of good regulatory reform to make it easier and faster to get permits, to, to really force cities to zone for a lot more housing. There are still challenges. So in San Francisco, um, the fees that are charged for development, in San Francisco, it's almost $200,000 per housing unit. There are other cities that it's more like 20,000 per housing unit. And so we continue in some cities like San Francisco to make strides and improvements, but there is still work to do. Senator Skinner, the state and national policies are under attack. Uh, you know, a lot of pushback against climate and energy policies. Washington's measure is facing a, a ballot measure there to change what some Washington did with the support of BP, by the way, um, that's under attack. Canadian Prime Minister uh, Trudeau's re-election bid is facing headwinds because of a nationwide carbon tax. New York Governor Kathy Hochul is considering watering down that state's price on carbon pollution. How do you see the national picture? Because California is often seen as leading on this. And then there's, there seems to be some real headwinds these days. Well, inflation is affecting that. I think inflation is... Uh... Mm -hmm concern beyond just the U.S. Um, and of course, don't minimize the role of the fossil fuel companies in blaming climate policies on their outrageous gas prices. <laughs> don't even get me started. But let's look at California again. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. Yes, prices are higher. It's, there is a cost of living here that is higher than a lot of other places, but that was real even before we started aggressively acting on protecting the climate. Now, our polls show that Californians are still very much in support of action on the climate crisis. They know it's real. There's no denying of the science. But when people are feeling pinched in their pocketbook, that always That's impacts, where it breaks down. Right? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm for yeah. it, but what's it going to cost yeah. me, right? Yes. Yeah. And so far, Californians have been in alignment, and I hope that we can stay there, and we're trying to do our best. I mean, this is why we care a lot about electricity rates. We don't want them to get much higher or higher at all. But as we know that as we electrify, we get all the vehicles on uh, electricity that, you know, that means you're going to have to generate more electricity and have more transmission and such. So these are challenges that we're going to have to navigate very carefully Senator Weiner, the Hitteridge Foundation has a very ambitious plan to really not just double down, triple down on fossil fuels in the event of a, a second Trump presidency. A lot of things will come under attack. California's waiver under the Clean Air uh, Act to have uh, cleaner air standards, et cetera, will really come under attack with you know a conservative Supreme Court sitting there to, to back him up. What are you thinking there in terms of how California can continue as a climate leader 
in a second Trump presidency? I mean, as it's sort of backing up, the, the key thing to do is to win elections and make sure he doesn't come back in and make sure that Congress doesn't go in a negative direction. Uh, elections have consequences. And I just want to put it out there. If they, God forbid, take the White House and Congress, we'll be playing intense defense. Uh, but let's not get there. Let's not right, even get right. there. And we um, cannot undo the damage that a Trump presidency could do in terms of all of the the climate progress that's been made in the U.S. We could never, even the best defense that California put, so nobody should get any illusion about that. Is the, the focus on climate reducing or elevating the, the power of fossil fuel companies? Because they, they, they kind of, they have a, a lot at stake. You know, it's life and death for them. Is, it, is their power waxing or waning in Sacramento? It does not mean death for them. Corporations in our country, they diversify. They'll go wherever they can make money. And I'm like, it's their fault that they haven't figured it out yet, those oil companies, how to make money on everything else. California is still the fifth largest economy in the world. Even though we're only that small portion of emissions, our leadership has set the standard. The fact that we started on the utility-grade batteries, now the rest of the country is following us, and so is the rest of the world. Our beginning of EV sales, sure, they might be a little lower right now, but we set the trend. All the auto manufacturers are making EVs now. So we have to keep setting that trend, and the oil companies should diversify and figure out how to be profitable in a climate protective economy instead of in a climate damaging economy. We know that California continues to attract companies here, companies that move here, companies that start here, companies that grow here. So, the, you know, you can have a progressive government that, you know, has progressive taxation and protects workers and the environment and still thrive. And in fact, uh, that sometimes can help you thrive. Right. So I'm a policy nerd, and I think of you know think about a, a lot of you know policy is, is really important. A lot of the climate conversation is very technical, et cetera. I've also learned we need to teach people on different levels, emotional levels, their whole selves. So where where do you go personally to try to connect with people on a deeper emotional level to convey the stakes and urgency of climate? I have not encountered that many people here in California that don't feel the urgency. It's more they feel overwhelmed. They're not sure like what priorities. And of course, we have to just survive. We have to live day to day. What can I do? Right. Now I feel my challenge and everybody's is to give everyone hope. To act, we need hope. So I look at the circumstance and I look at technology, which I've not always been a fan of. I'm not a Luddite, but I'm not. And, but I look at these technological breakthroughs. Here's an example. Today, Governor Newsom announced a new battery storage facility up in Winters. These are big batteries that allow us, you power them with the solar energy, and then when the sun's down, you use that big battery to power the grid. We now have in California 10,000 megawatts, and I'll make it easier to understand. That's five Diablo Canyon power plants worth. We have five Diablo Canyon power plants That's our worth nuclear power plant, yeah. of battery storage that it gets powered by the sun and then can be plugged in when we need it and the sun's not shining. That's hope. So I see technological breakthroughs. I don't know what all of them will be yet, but I see those and that's what gives me hope and I hope to convey hope to everyone else. That was California State Senator Scott Weiner and Nancy Skinner. Today's show is all about how California's moves to cleaner cars and power might impact the rest of the country. Coming up, for a long time, people were concerned that the state's solar incentives program were favoring high-income residents. Then a new plan was put in place. Now some say the state solved one problem and created another. When communities of color were finally getting in the door to create a more equitable solar program, that's when they cut off the compensation for the, the, those who are installing solar. That's up next. We'll be right back. Please help us get more people talking about climate by sharing this episode with a friend. We'd also love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a rating or a review right now from your device. Thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm Dan Cortler, the host of TED Climate. 
Each episode, we unpack the problems and solutions of climate change. This season of the show, we're getting into some big ideas that make us optimistic about the future, like meat grown from cells and leather made from mushrooms. And the best part? We look at how building a greener future can be an upgrade instead of a sacrifice. Find and follow TED Climate wherever you're listening to this. California's Air Resources Board is the most powerful climate force you've never heard of. It's mostly referred to by its acronym CARB. It was created in 1967 by Governor Ronald Reagan, and it's responsible for regulating emissions from factories, trucks and cars, dairies, and more. It touches most of the California economy, and in my view, the head of the agency is one of the most influential climate leaders in the whole country, right behind the head of the U.S. EPA. We invited CARB Chair Leanne Randolph and Mary Rose Tarook of the California Environmental Justice Alliance to be part of SF Climate Week. You talked with them about cleaning up the air in all parts of the state, including communities near freeways and warehouses, with lots of diesel trucks spewing toxic pollution. Leanne, researchers at the group Next 10 calculated that the state has reduced emissions on average about 1.5 percent a year between 2010 and 2021. And to reach our 2030 goals, we'd have to reduce emissions by four and a half percent a year, basically three X from what we've done so far. We've already done the easy stuff right? Now the harder stuff comes. So how can we multiply by 3x emission reductions when we're getting to the harder work? One of our responsibilities at CARB is to adopt the climate change scoping plan that gets updated every five years. And when we did our most recent update at the end of 2022, we were really clear that here's the suite of strategies. Here are the things that need to happen. But unless they actually happen and unless the deployment happens, we will not reach our goals. So deployment is absolutely critical. We need the renewable energy that is going to support the transition to move as much as we can to electricity. Our market-based programs need to get more stringent. We are working on that right now. We are looking at both our low-carbon fuel standard program and our cap-and-trade program, looking at how they can achieve more reductions. And we are continuing to consider our regulatory strategies. One thing that's important to recognize is that it's not just about the market-based programs. It's about the critical regulations that drive emissions reductions. It's about advanced clean cars too, 100% new car sales, zero emission by 2035. It's about advanced clean trucks and advanced clean fleets. Those rules together will transition the heavy-duty sector to zero emission by 2045, with new sales being zero emission by 2036. And it's those rules that will really benefit communities that live along freeways, that live near ports, that live near the incredibly growing warehouse industry. And so let me jump in there. Truckers okay. say they can't afford it. Truckers say that electric truck and I saw electric trucks driving to the L.A. recently. I was yeah. like, so excited. There they are. Electric yeah. trucks on the road. They're there. Um, right. And they cost double of a diesel truck. Right. And so sounds great. But, you, you know, unless you're going to pay truckers a bunch of money, $250,000 to buy a truck that they could buy for $125,000. How's it going to happen? few things I would say. First of all, the, the costs will continue to go down. We are already seeing reductions in battery prices as we anticipated when we adopt the rule and considered the rates of adoption. That battery technology will continue to uh, reduce in price. Incentives do help. The total cost of ownership is a really important conversation to have with people who are buying these trucks. You know, you have a higher upfront cost, but you have lower maintenance cost and lower fueling costs. So this is not a transition that's going to happen overnight. And, and it's really about the trends. And those trends aren't necessarily linear. You know, you will have some sectors that have breakthroughs and move forward and then other sectors that are maybe going slower than you think they're going to go. The key is that we keep moving forward with all of our strategies and we get the rules in place that ensure that the companies and industries will be making the transition and will continue to move forward. And I'm just going to say one more thing about that, which is the incredible support from the federal government. When we adopted our scoping plan, we did not 
model in the Inflation Reduction Act or the Infrastructure and Jobs Act because they were brand new and we didn't have time to put it into our modeling. So the way I think of those laws is they put wind in our sails. You know, we had a plan. We could show that that plan would reduce greenhouse gas emissions and still sustain a strong economy. And now we have even more support. They have heavy-duty vehicle incentives as well. Mary Rose, most people who receive Amazon packages come to the Commonwealth Club, listen to this show, don't live in a diesel death quarter or or near a port or near a, a warehouse where there's a lot of concentration of diesel trucks. So tell us how important this getting away from diesel, which has many carcinogens, creates all sorts of health problems. How important is this? So when... If my my kids live next to the freeway and and I'm spending multiple times a year taking them to the emergency room for exacerbated asthma, mm -hmm. like what what is the the cost of like your child's health? You know, those are the types of ways that we approach these climate and environmental policies from environmental justice communities is is from from our our health, the health of our families, and so. What will it cost for us to change our ways, this, this, the polluting economy that we belong to? Like, sometimes it, it does feel like really big to make that change and that transition. But here we are actually integrating our health ideas into climate and environmental policy. And, and this is why when we say we have to move from those diesel trucks it's environmental racism. And so we are trying to correct those kinds of policies and decisions that have been made in the past. And it's not just good for environmental justice communities. It's good for everybody when we reduce the pollution coming out of diesel trucks. And it's not that we don't have the technologies or the solutions for that or even the money. There's a lot of free money, actually, that I will say CARB is giving, giving away to corporations through free allowances through these market mechanisms. And the environmental justice community has actually oppose those kinds of measures uh, or the ways that CARB has designed our, our climate program and the, where the funds flow. Like if anybody needs free money, it's, it's low-income communities. Who's paying too much now for skyrocketing elect electricity rates? We need to actually move funds smartly, especially to the people who need them the most. And when we're talking about affordability, if I'm earning 30000 a year, that's a, my affordability for, for my electricity costs is different than if I'm earning $2 million a year. And so we need to be talking let's, about the let's, economics Let's get to there. electricity affordability. First, I want to have Leanne respond to this point that, you know, is CARB handing out corporate welfare through cap and trade? Well, the uh, free allowances are set by statute based on the fact that they are, industries are trade exposed. And when the most recent statutory cap and trade update was passed, basically the legislature said, we're going to consider all industries trade exposed. And and so, you know, they sort of... Uh, so you can't change that. The, the legislature thumb. did it. Right, right. And this and, goes back to trying to get business on board, not punish them too hard, because we want business to, to be right. part of this transition. It is, you know, it it is extremely, it's sort of extremely challenging kind of making this transition, because one of the other criticisms we get is, oh, well, if you increase the cost on companies to comply, they raise their prices, they raise their gas prices, they raise their consumer product prices, and that has an impact on affordability as well. Sure, they're passing right? through, sure. They're passing through. So, you know, as a regulatory agency and as an agency sort of trying to figure out how to move the needle on climate through both a regulatory process and through um, market-based strategies, you know, we're always trying to strike that balance of uh, ensuring that we are continuing to move the transition forward, but recognizing that we have to be mindful of um, the impacts of our rules on the functioning of the economy. Um, and, you know, we are legally obligated to do that. For every rule, we have to do an economic analysis that fully accounts for the impacts on the economy. And one of the ways we account for those impacts is by pointing out the 
the public health benefits. Because unfortunately, when you have to do an economic analysis, you have to look at public health benefits, not from the perspective of a scared parent in an emergency room on a Saturday night, but from the perspective of how much money is it going to save the healthcare system? And the reality is it will save money in the healthcare system. And so the larger economy benefits from our regulatory work. And we need to continue to tell that story, but we also have to be mindful of the fact that there are jobs and livelihoods that depend on a strong economy. And so we need to make this transition in a way that helps support those jobs. And I'll just sort of throw out one last little point, which is, I think it's really important when companies think about making this transition or when investors think about investing in new technologies and new companies, that one of the questions they ask is, what kind of jobs are you providing? Are you providing actual full-time jobs with benefits, with reasonable salaries, or are you doing the venture capital as cheap as possible race to the bottom? I think it's really important that that everyone involved in this transition ask themselves that question. Well, most companies pay their employees as, as little as possible, well, right? right. That, that's, the, that's how it works. I want to move on to you know, the affordability of um, electricity. Uh, Mary Rose, California kneecapped rooftop solar allegedly because the prices paid for rooftop solar sent to the grid was favoring wealthy people and leaving out low-income people. There's sort of this bougie bias. The new program known as Net Metering 3.0 was supposed to bring rooftop solar to renters and others who had difficulty affording it before. Do you think California's new rooftop solar math is delivering as promised? And, you know, why? <laughs> Um, environmental justice communities, all you know, m millions of people across California want to see clean energy on their rooftops. The thing is, not all of us own our rooftops, right? And so there's, especially from environmental justice communities, most of us are renters. So how do we also make sure that our solar programs are reaching renters? And so the California Environmental Justice Alliance, where I work, we have introduced bills in the legislature and have gotten laws where we're going to dedicate funding that, uh, for solar on um, affordable housing and create a program for community solar so that our, that our you know, community centers, our healthcare centers, other community buildings can also provide that kind of um, clean energy in the neighborhood. But What's happened with the, the net energy metering and the rooftop solar redesign is that <laughs> when, when communities of color were finally getting in the door to create a more equitable solar program, that's when they cut off the compensation for the, the, those who are installing solar. So it happened at the wrong time. I think there needs to be an equitable redesign of, of net metering. And they need to take a, into account how to make it equitable. But that so, was what this was supposed to do. But are you saying that the Public Utilities Commission that sets these rates is kind of uh, has a history of being pretty cozy with industry? Are you saying they're kind of cozy, cozy? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so again, I, I thought we were supposed to fix that. Well, who, who's who's uh, which agency is allowing all our skyrocketing rates from? The investor-owned utilities. The Thirty-eight CPUC, percent in, in reason. Who, three who is years. blocking yeah. our community solar program from getting implemented the right way? The CPUC. And so, there's a lot that that especially the governor Newsom could do to make the CPUC more responsive to the 99 percent of Californians in in the state. And I think that that could because they're the ones making decisions and they need to to be more accountable to to people and 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 less about these private utilities. You used to be on the public utilities <laughs> commission. So, um... I think I I can I can weigh in here. Um I guess I'd say a couple of things. So, full disclosure, I voted on NEM 2.0, which was the last sort of that energy meter previous the, yeah. yeah. Um and at that time and I said this from the dais, I made it very clear because the reality is that the NEM program requires utilities to buy electrons that they could buy for dirt cheap from utility 
facilities and pay a retail rate to individuals who have rooftop solar. And that historically, that program has benefited people like me who could afford to put rooftop solar on their roof and compensated me for electrons that I didn't need to be compensated for. And the purpose was the right purpose. The purpose was to build a rooftop solar industry and to get it going. The challenge is that the economics of solar have shifted. And as I said, when I voted on NEM 2.0, this cannot go on forever. The industry has to figure out a way to make its product more attractive, more accessible, without the cost shift to the ratepayers who can't afford to put so rooftops solar. So the starting subsidies over, take off the training wheels, you got to right. be a big, put on your big boy pants and, and, and survive. Right. Full disclosure, I have not read the community solar uh, proposed decision that is currently out, so I can't comment it's on bad. that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I, but I just think it's really important to remember that, you know, we are trying to make this transition in a way that is as fair and equitable as, as possible. And things that we used to do, like giving, you know, on the hood rebates for people with no regard to income or the MSRP of the vehicle, or providing full retail compensation for electrons that could be purchased for much cheaper, that's just not equitable. And we have to move away from that model. I want to ask a philosophical question. You know, there's a question about um, how to approach fossil fuel companies. Some people would say fossil fuel companies are the villains. Let's, you know, slit their throats and, and, you know, and, and do away with them. And others would say, no, tame the beast. Let's lure them into this economy. Let's, you know, encourage them. And hydrogen is a way to do that, right? A lot of the fossil fuel companies and big industrial companies favor hydrogen because it fits into their business model. So are you in the slit the throat or kind of tame the beast kind of? Uh, well, okay, so our scoping plan calls for a 94% reduction in fossil fuel use, right? That is our goal. Our goal is to stop relying on fossil fuels. And so the way we think about that is, you know, for instance, in the hydrogen hub process, that application is for renewable hydrogen. It is for hydrogen produced from renewable energy. And the state is putting a lot of effort into building that market and building that supply so that we don't have to use fossil fuels for hydrogen. So that's, that's one thing I would point out. The second thing is a lot of the work we do is about reducing the demand for fossil fuels. It is about building that renewable energy. It is about deploying zero emission appliances. It is about deploying zero emission trucks all the way from class two delivery vans up to class eight trucks. And we, even in our most aggressive projections, it takes time to do that. Mary Rose, uh, something that I think that's been overlooked that happened this year that's really interesting is a ban on gasoline-powered lawnmowers, you know, leaf blowers, that sort of thing, uh, which I think the industry pretty much got on board with pretty quickly. They didn't, I didn't see the kind of pushback. It's often, you know, immigrants, low-skilled laborers who are using those, you know, those, those equipment. Or gardeners, yeah. Yeah, gardener, right? Mm -hmm. Who are breathing it, et cetera. I, you know, no one who's like, I don't like carrying uh, gasoline around in my truck because it smells. I'm breathing the fumes when I'm driving around my leaf blower. They, the, the electric ones sound much better than those wee, you know, leaf blowers, gas blowers. You know, how big a deal is that and it, are there cost considerations there? Because you know, again, you know, electric leaf blower costs more than a gasoline one up front. This is where there's free money <laughs> from from the greenhouse gas reduction fund from polluters that can actually be used as incentives for a transition for especially like workers like our gardeners, our immigrant gardeners, etc. And there's there's money there. And that's where we think, you know, the equitable use of the funds that are in the greenhouse gas reduction fund could go. So But how that, many gardeners know how to get money from CARB, right? You got Well, like, this is so what I we tell CARB is that you need to actually work in the you know, with communities to do the marketing 
because the community-based organizations know where our families who work in, in these gardens and we, we could do a really good job of, of marketing. So that, that's kind of the partnership that we have been calling for with CARB and other agencies is that we're on the ground. We have relationships with the people that you're trying to serve. Let us like help <laughs> help co-create these programs. And, you know, you were talking leaf blowers, but my main campaign actually out of Seha is to help retire the 200 gas fired power plants in the state. Talk about that as a <laughs> as a big project that's that's consequential to our future and how we're going to solve climate change is that California is like pumped with methane gas and these 200 power plants all across the state that are harming us. And we are trying to figure out the transition from those dirty power plants into uh, clean energy sources that we can even own. And after many years of advocacy, we got a good decision from the CPUC in, in their long-term planning for gas retirement to actually slash emissions by half in the next 10 years. So imagine 200 power plants in the next 10 years where we're going to get emissions reductions, half of that capacity. We want the power plants and environmental justice communities to be retired first. That was Leanne Randolph, chair of the California Air Resources Board, and Mary Rose Taruk with the California Environmental Justice Alliance. Coming up, what role could fossil fuel companies play in transitioning away from fossil fuels? They are investing in a lot of these clean energy technologies. They also have an amazing workforce, an amazing skilled workforce that needs to be recognized for being partners in this space. That's up next when Climate One continues. In spite of California's commitment to clean energy, it's home to a lot of oil and gas production, too. That means the industry has powerful lobbies in state politics and lots of economic pull. During SF Climate Week, I invited Jennifer Barrera, president and CEO of the California Chamber of Commerce, and California Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis to talk about the energy transition. Here's Jennifer Barrera. There's no question about the direction in which we're moving. We're moving into a clean energy economy. And I think the businesses of the past are not the businesses that are here today. I think a lot of our members, a lot of the businesses in California are embracing it and are planning for it. But there's questions about sort of pace and cost. Is that he's like, yeah, we all agree, you know, on the clean energy future, but we're only putting 1% of our money into the, the, those investments. So is that right? Pace and cost are where the differences are? Well, I think it's certainly both of those are uh, significant when we talk about this discussion. And when you say costs, of course, you know, going and changing kind of how we energize this economy is going to be a cost. It's obviously building those renewable uh, energy sources, whether it's developing our infrastructure to make sure that we're able to uh, have a reliable grid uh, with the energy sources. I mean, all of these things are going to cost money and we need to figure out how those costs are going to be borne. So there's that side of the cost equation, but there's also the side of the cost equation, of course, if we do nothing and what happens to our economy, our businesses are, are part of the communities just like everyone else. They are subject to the same changes we're seeing in the climate as well with regards to the wildfires and the, the weather patterns and things of that nature. So there's that cost if we do nothing. Mm -hmm. And all of these costs are going to be borne in our state by our taxpayers, by our businesses, by our consumers. And that is a sensitive subject. We do polls on a regular basis uh, at Cal Chamber just to kind of get a sense of where the voters are in California. And no question, voters are definitely concerned about climate change. They're definitely supportive of clean energy. But then when you start asking them the follow-up questions about how much are you willing to pay? Yeah, not much, that, thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> that starts to taper off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah. We all want things that we, we don't want to pay for them. Eleni, California budget is still in flux right now, but it is a bad budget year. Maybe not as bad as we thought a little while ago, but it's clear that we're facing a major deficit. The, def the governor's proposed some cuts to climate programs, and there's real concern about that. So how concerned are you about climate, uh, the budget situation affecting California's climate leadership? So first of all, Greg, let me just say what a privilege it is to be here during Climate Week at Climate One. And I really just want to underscore for everyone who's here and who's listening how extraordinary it is that we just heard from the head of the California Chamber of Commerce 
talking about the intention of California and the direction in transitioning to a carbon-free energy future, and that that is the future of our state in terms of our values, uh, but it is also the future of our economy. Yeah, we don't hear that from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, right? You don't, and I suspect, Jennifer, that that would not be a common thing you would hear from most states, but California is different. And it isn't just hopefulness. It is, it is proven. So if you look at the numbers for the state of California, over the last 24 years, since the year 2000, the population of the state of California has grown by about 17%. And our emissions have come down by about 16% all while the California economy has grown by about 68%. So we can grow the economy and not grow emissions, that decoupling. We that can we, grow yeah. the economy. We can grow the population while we are cutting emissions. This is remarkable. And I, I think more than anything, companies, whether they're large companies, whether they're small businesses, whether they're opportunities for uh, for minority-owned businesses to have a piece of it, whether it's foreign direct investment coming into California, there is enormous opportunity to invest in the, the transition to carbon-free energy future. We are the largest um, consumer market in the country. People are ready and, and willing to try new technologies. Again, I think the electric vehicle is a great example of that, as well as the fact that two times the amount of venture capital of any other state is allocated here in California. Right. A lot happens here. Jennifer, a lot gets invented here. Solar panels, semiconductors, Tesla started here, right? But then these companies tend to go elsewhere to manufacture, to, to develop their technology. Some of that's, that's cheap labor. So, you know, talk about the competitive context, because some people would say that whoever controls these clean technologies controls the 21st century. And right now, that's China. Yeah. Well, um, certainly we are competing, uh, obviously, on a national perspective with other states, but of course we're competing in the international markets with the clean energy technology and what is being developed. And we are an innovative state, and we're very proud of that. So we need to maintain that competitiveness and that innovation, and we need really to focus on how we can keep these companies in California, keep them here, but also attract them here. We want them to develop these um, technologies here. We want them to manufacture these products here. That's great paying jobs um, here in California, and we want to attract more of it. How do you do that? We are a high-cost state. There's no question about it. We have higher, obviously, taxes. I know uh, the governor talks about that quite often, but when you compare us just on a percentage basis, we're higher in costs with regards to our taxes. Our housing is expensive. We have, you know, higher costs uh, for our consumers. So knowing that and knowing where we're starting from, what other things can we do to be competitive? Well, one of the biggest things that we are supportive of and pushing for is we have to create an environment where they can get things done. We need to expedite our processes with regards to permitting and siting to make sure that they have the opportunity to site their projects here, build them in a timely manner and aren't delayed because delay costs money. And when they can go to other states and get it done where they're welcoming them and identifying the sites uh, available for them to develop some of these facilities, that's a competitive advantage that I think we can address. Right. And, and the environmentalist Bill McKibben wrote a big article in uh, this Bay Area based magazine, Mother Jones, saying environmentalists need to say yes more. They've been very good at uh, saying no. Eleni, uh, California automakers have signaled the end of newly made uh, gasoline, internal combustion engines, diesel and gasoline. Even Stellantis, which has been a laggard maker of Dodge and Jeep, kind of lined up with California recently on their policies. Do you support the policies that move away from oil and see the, the, the end of the internal combustion engine? Well, I think that what we know is that this is a transition and transitions are not always you know, linear. Or and smooth, so yeah. It, yeah, or smooth. I mean, it, it is a process. But look at where we are. You mentioned Tesla. Tesla received billions of dollars in, in tax credits and rebates for those buying them and all kinds of programs for it to get off the ground. Yeah, Elon and, Musk doesn't talk about that much, but government, he, well, he, they wouldn't be here if and, the federal government didn't And help. he really <laughs> pushes back. But, you know, True, Elon Musk is not very grateful, but <laughs> California did not ask for gratitude when we set those programs up. We wanted to seed innovation, and it worked. 
So today, about half of the electric vehicles in the United States are on the roads here in California. About 25% of vehicles sold in California last year uh, were uh, zero emission vehicles. And uh, the governor signed an executive order that by 2035, all the cars sold in California need to be zero emission vehicles. So we ceded the ability for a company like Tesla to take advantage of the of the opportunity here, and that has completely transformed the automotive industry. California should take credit for that. That wouldn't have happened in Detroit. If Detroit had been had their way, it wouldn't have happened. No, no question about it. California is a big oil producing state. Many people don't realize. You know, Chevron and other uh, oil companies are a big part of the Cal Chamber. What's your position on sort of this sunsetting of internal combustion engines, which is happening with a policy prod? And and GM has said voluntarily, without any policy stick, said they're going in the same direction. So is the chamber on board with that? Yeah, we do have oil and gas companies as a part of our membership. And I think my perspective on it and what I, I hope others will see is that these companies are energy companies at the end of the day. And they are going to be a part of uh, the conversation here in California for the foreseeable future. We are not in a place yet where we can operate our grid and support our transportation infrastructure without them. They have the resources to invest in a lot of this clean energy. They are investing in a lot of these clean energy technologies. And I think they need to be recognized for being partners in this space. They also have an amazing workforce, an amazing skilled workforce that needs to have be recognized for the skills that they contribute to this. They should have a seat at the table. I think they do. Um, but this is a part of the discussion as well, is how do we take that existing workforce and start transitioning them and shifting them to these other technologies and making sure that they have a place to go if that is the direction the state is heading. Right. And we did a whole episode, a climate one on, on, uh, geothermal, which is actually an area that's growing. And that's an area where actually there are transferable skills from oil and gas. Though um, on the investment side, yeah, they often say that they're investing in clean energy. But when you look at when you look at their numbers, it's like one or 2% of their capital expenditures are actually going toward renewables. Eleni, I'd like to ask you, how has climate change personally affected you? Well, I, I represent 39 million Californians. It's my job to see how climate change is affecting everyone in our state. Extreme weather has wrecked havoc on the state of California. We have had some of the most severe wildfires, not just in the recorded history of California, but even researchers that can go back and look at you know, rings on trees, that this is an unprecedented... Biblical profile. Yeah. Biblical. I mean, you, you talk to firefighters and they will tell you about fire tornadoes um, up in paradise, the terrible loss of life up in paradise. The fire traveled at a rate of a football field per second, throwing debris a mile ahead and so we have learned a lot. You know, four of the most catastrophic wildfires in our history have happened, uh, sorry, six of them just in the last four years. Personally, I can tell you, I was here in San Francisco several times when we had air purifiers going full blast in our apartment and we still couldn't breathe. And it was terrifying. The other thing is that it is seriously impacting our water supply. So we had five years of drought which I'll tell you, two years ago before the atmospheric rivers started coming in in January around, I guess, December of 22, January of 23, up until then, we were looking at major, major problems with a lack of water. And then it started raining one atmospheric river after the other. And so what the vision has to be, in my opinion, from what we've learned just in the last few years, is we must invest in our storage system so that we can manage... Does that mean more dams? It means... in So there's one reservoir that people are very hopeful about, the Sites Reservoir. It is a major Make project. Make it big, so bigger. But mm. we have all kinds of existing reservoirs that could be expanded in order to be able to basically hold more water. But the other thing that we know a lot more about is groundwater recharge. So being able to get water in the ground during the rainy times, either by 
you know, basically just spreading it all over. Flooding fields. Flooding yeah. fields mm -hmm. or actually putting it right back in, into the aquifer. These are really, I think, the, the areas that we're going to have to invest in. Eleni, you work on the State Lands Commission, which deals with sea level rise. You know, this is kind of slowly eroding. All sorts of problems are going to cost a lot of money to 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 armor the coast. And if I want to put a seawall and you're next door, my defense can hurt you or my other neighbors. So how are we going to approach uh, sea level rise? And how again, back to how are we going to pay for it? Right. Well, a lot of work has been done, and um, the Ocean Protection Council uh, has finished a study recently on some of the different ways that you can not just harden with seawalls, but with even setbacks, landscape, various things. Mangroves, um, but, yeah. Right, right, but we're looking at the potential. I mean, we know this is coming. We've already uh, experienced it. So it's going to have a cost. There's no question about it. Eleni Kulakas and Jennifer Barra, thank you very much for thank sharing you. your insights before we get there. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg. On Climate One Today, we've been showcasing the live interviews we recorded at the Commonwealth Club during SF Climate Week. You can hear even more of those conversations by going to our website, climateone.org, or subscribing to our podcast. And if you live in the Bay Area, make sure you sign up for our newsletter to get info about our future live events. We'd love to see you here. Talking about climate can be hard, and it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or a review. Or consider joining us on Patreon and supporting the show that way. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Ariana Brocious is co-host, editor, and producer. Austin Cologne is producer and editor. Megan Basili is our production manager and producer. Wincy Shada is our development manager. Ben Testani is our communications manager. Jenny Lawton is consulting producer. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy and Philip Young are co-CEOs of the Commonwealth Club World Affairs, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>